Amen. Well, let's get directly into the word of the Lord. And um, as a disclaimer, I'll do as Sister Dion did last week. Uh, we're going to continue in the vein of teaching. Um, so let's prepare our hearts and minds to do that tonight. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to look in uh, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 just to start off. While it's not the uh, emphasis of the lesson tonight, but I think it'll help us understand why we're doing the lessons um, and doing it in this manner. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. Thank God for my pastor and his wife. Appreciate them, their love and their consistency, and then uh, telling us like it is. I'm trying to make it into heaven, and um, I need somebody that's going to tell me how to get there. Amen. So I love them and I appreciate them and this great ministry and the great people of God tonight. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. It reads, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Let's go to God right now in prayer for tonight's lesson. Dear Lord, we give you glory on the praise. We thank you for who you are. We bless your name, O God. Give us revelation tonight. Open up our eyes and understanding, O God, and help us, O God, that we might be converted and that we will love your word, O God, and your law, O God. And we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Uh, the purpose of me reading that um, is just to give us an understanding why we're going into the vein of teaching a little bit more as opposed to the, um, the, the preaching um, sometimes with the teaching, we can get a better grasp of why we do what we do. Um, sometimes with the preaching, um, it will stir us up to do some things, but sometimes we may leave uh, not understanding exactly why we do. That does take study. Uh, the scripture says to study, to show yourself approved. And so there is a necessity to also study the word of God so that it can ground us in the word of God. Um, when we study and we know what we no, it's not about I heard it or I know somebody at my church said it. It's about I know what I know. Um, it, it builds our faith to a greater level. And so we ought to have our, ba our faith sure and, um, and steadfast because a lot of different doctrines and things we'll hear, um, you know, as we go out of this church, um, it, it will discourage us or, or we'll be confused um, going out. And so we should never, ever in my opinion, leave an apostolic church to go to a church that's not apostolic. Um, there are some things we ought to know and say, well, you at least need to be teaching this because I know it's the word of God. And so uh, that never really makes any sense to me. You may be mad at the people or mad at the pastor or somebody like that, but you never go down to something that's not even true. You ought to know, say, well, at least this is true. And a lot of times that to keep you in that church. You may say, well, I don't like what somebody said to me, but I know this is true. So I need to stick around because, again, I'm just trying to make it to heaven. Um, I will, we'll make up. We'll be friends when we get there. I just need to stay in what's true. And so we don't want to perish because of lack of knowledge. Actually, tonight, the topic of our discussion is actually water baptism. It's, a, um, it's understood that it's essential to salvation. It's taught um, in apostolic settings that it is um, essential to salvation. And so it's a topic in which that we ought to have some knowledge about. Um, it's not a place that we ought to waver in. We not, not, ought not to question um, how we're baptized or why we're baptized because it is essential to salvation. And in this scripture, there are two types of salvation. And I'm going to warn you now, go ahead and grab your Bibles and bring, pull those out and keep them out because we'll be going to some various scriptures. And um, the individual that's typing up those scriptures and putting them on the screen, um, just always stay ready. Um, in Mark chapter 1, in verse 8, um, it, it gives us uh, an idea of some of the, the couple of baptisms um, that the Bible talks about. In particular, um, it says this, indeed have, in, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And so this is John the Baptist speaking here. And he's talking about a water baptism as well as a Holy Ghost or spirit baptism. But the lesson focus for tonight will be water baptism. We'll discuss three things tonight. Understanding its necessity, uh, what it does, and the mode in which it should be administered. And I've tried to make sure I uh, edit enough of my notes so that we can get all three topics in there in this 40-minute uh, time frame. Let's turn now uh, to Genesis chapter 17. We'll begin in discussing the understanding the necessity of water baptism. Why do we preach 
it's necessary. A lot of people will disagree with that, say, well, it's not really necessary. Some people will argue that it's just some outward show um, of good faith towards God or um, different things or different ideas that people have. But it's always good to go into Scripture and, and really pick apart why it's necessary if somebody says it's necessary. Again, I want to make it into heaven. Genesis chapter 17, and we're going to read verses 10 through 14. Um, verses, verse 10 through 14 says this, this is my covenant, and this is God speaking with Abram. He says, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of an, any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and that is bought with uh, thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man shall... Um, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So here it is. Um, God is speaking to Abram or Abraham. Um, he was previously known as Abram. And in Genesis chapter 12, uh, the Lord deals with Abram in such a way that he's called on him, calling him away from his people. And he's saying, listen, uh, what I want you to do is get away from all the people that you know and, and, and separate yourself, and I'm going to make of you a great nation. So he put some requirements on Abram, but he's also promising Abram some blessings. And he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to uh, bless whoever blesses you. I'm going to curse whoever curses you. Um, and I'm going to be a God unto you, and I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And chapter 17, um, he reiterates some of the blessings, and then he gives them some other uh, instructions, some further instructions as to how this relationship or this agreement, our covenant is going to work between them. He says, now, he, this, this agreement that we have, I, I'm going to do this for you and you're going to do something for me. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in place a, uh, um, some type of token or a, a sign that we have an agreement. And what he did was he says this, that it was going to be circumcision. In verse 10 through 14, circumcision is the token or covenant or a sign or of the agreement. So here's what, how people are going to know that we have some agreement between us. In verse 12, he lists a category of those to be circumcised um, in, in his house. He says, now, it is interesting to note that if they did not follow um, this, this, this token or this sign, they didn't do it, do what the Lord says, then they weren't going to be in agreement with the Lord. So it was, it was important that that happened, whether they agree with it or not. He says, listen, anybody part of your household, um, this is what they're going to have to do. He says, every male child on, eighth, on the eighth day, they were going to have to be circumcised. That's what they needed to do, whether they liked it or not, whether they were comfortable with it or not. And also, those individuals that were already part of Abraham's house at that particular time, including Abram, had to be circumcised. So these grown men um, who never heard of circumcision um, had to be circumcised. And then from that point forward, any child that was born into that house, um, on the eighth day, they would have to circumcise that child. Um, so anybody, and furthermore, anybody born in the house uh, would have to be circumcised. Again, that included the adults that was already born into the house. And then anyone that was bought with money had to be circumcised because God was giving Abraham a blessing. And he says, anyone who wants to be part of this blessing, anyone who wants to get part of what I'm sharing with you, they're going to have to be circumcised. Verse 13 says that it's an everlasting covenant. It wasn't going to go away. And we know how the Lord's word, he's just not getting rid of. It. He's not eradicating it. He may uh, show it to us in a different way. But it's an everlasting thing that he makes mention here. It's an everlasting covenant or an everlasting agreement, an agreement that's going to last forever. There's something that needs to be done forever. And so if we know the agreement was going to be last forever, then the conditions of the agreement aren't going away at any point in time also. So if we expect God to keep his word, or Abram was going to say, well, I expect you to keep your word, then he's going to say, well, I expect you to keep the agreement as well. And also, any children that you have, if they want to be in agreement with me, with this, in this agreement, they're going to have to fall in line with the terms of the agreement. Verse 14, again, as I mentioned earlier, he says, anybody that is not circumcised, then they will be cut off. 
They're not going to be, they're not going to be, uh, be partakers of this um, inheritance that I'm promising you and the blessings that I'm promising you. And so in a natural sense, then anybody that was born in the house or was joined to the house in any of these ways had to be circumcised. And so I think I've emphasized that enough. They had to be circumcised. It was, it was imperative that they did that if they um, wanted to have any of the inheritance. You couldn't come into the house and say, well, I'm a better worker. Um, I'm a good person. Or I'm just born in the house. Hey, I'm your son. He says, well, even if you're my son, you still need to be circumcised. Abram would have had to say, well, you still need to be circumcised. Um, they, it had to happen. So everyone had to do that. Well, in the spiritual sense, we fall in all of those categories. We're in the same line with that because in reality, we are children of Abram because part of the, the, the a covenant or agreement, he says that I'm going to bless you. And in, in one portion of scripture, he says that they're gonna, he's going to have uh, many children and they're going to be as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. The sands of the sea represent more of a natural blessing. So naturally, he was going to have a ton of children. Um, are a lot of individual generations that come after him. Um, and, and that has to do with the is Israelites. However, the stars of the sky, it seems to indicate that there is going to also be some sort of spiritual um, blessing that was going to be given to him. And those are those that are linked to him spiritually, which is us. Romans 4 and verse 16, if you would turn there, it, 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 it backs up what I'm saying in terms of us being uh, the children of Abram. Romans 4 and 16 says this, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abram, Abraham, who is the father of us all. So this covenant then doesn't only extend to the nat natural seed, but also to the spiritual seed. He says, not just those that was born into his house and they are Israeli or Israelites. No, he says, listen, it's everybody. Because in reality, the, the walk that we have really began long before um, uh, Israel, the Israelites are even in Christian time. It started with Abram, Abraham. And it started with faith. It wasn't the law that saved them. As a matter of fact, anybody that followed the law, the Israelites in the wilderness and so forth, when they got the law from Moses, they did that stuff by faith. So everything was by faith. So therefore, Abraham is the father of us all because he moved by faith and he did what God asked him to do by faith. And so we in turn also, we're joined into this same group by faith because we heard the word of God, we obey the word of God, and by faith, we're linked into the same group. And so he's the father of us all. Remember now, I said in um, earlier on that there were in verse 12, there was three um, things are there's a category of individuals. He says that those folk that were born on the eighth day are, excuse me, not born on the eighth day, but on the eighth day, they were to be circumcised. Uh, that number eight, uh, when you're studying the numbers in scripture, it really re represents a new beginning. Um, things happen in sevens for perfection. Um, God created the heavens and the earth really in six days, but on the seventh day he rested. And so the next day, would be the first day or a new beginning. So the eighth day technically is a new beginning. And so there was a new beginning that is indicating here. So on some new beginning. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Lord says this concerning, or, the, or Paul says this regarding us. He says that, that we are a new creature. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So we also have a new beginning. And so we also have an eighth day once we come into Christ. Furthermore, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, talks about us being bought with a price. Didn't he say earlier, um, he said anyone that is bought, a servant that's bought um, and joins your house because they're bought, then they will also have to um, partake of this, this agreement says this, 1 Corinthians 6 and 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so we also are bought with the price. And so again, it makes us fall into this category. But greater than all those two things, I believe, is really that we have the ability to become sons in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And then we say sons, but it really has to do with being children of God. 
Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. You can pull that up. And the scripture says, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so there's a spiritual birth that makes us sons. And so, again, it makes us partakers of this covenant, covenant and agreement uh, with God. But, but the difference between us and Israel is that theirs was a natural thing, but a natural birth. Ours is a spiritual birth. And so if they had a natural um, uh, requirement in terms of circumcision in this everlasting covenant, then there probably would be a, a spiritual circumcision needed for us because now we're born spiritually. And at the spiritual birth, something has to take place. Uh, let me just go into a little bit more about this, the fact that there is a spiritual birth that's taking place. Let's go to John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And I'm actually going to read from the New Living Translation just for clarity. Um, I had it where I was going to read in the um, New King James. Uh, I'm sorry, the King James and, and this, but um, I think this will suffice. In the New Living Translation, it says this in verse uh, 5 of John chapter 3. It says, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Verse 6, humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. And so he's making the difference now between um, a natural birth and a spiritual birth. Same thing I'm doing. I'm telling you there's a natural birth and a spiritual birth. There's something happening when we they were born uh, naturally. They had to be circumcised. But I'm telling you that we're, there's also a spiritual birth and something that has to happen um, spiritually in terms of circumcision with us. And so Jesus is emphasizing um, that in the spirit birth, there's something that needs to take place. And he says, except the man be born of water and the spirit. And so this, this spirit birth really couples these two things. They have to really go together. The spirit has to do with, the spirit birth has to do with birthing something in you spiritually, which is why he puts it like this in the new, in the King James version, it says, except the man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. Um, the spirit there uh, that he's saying there is capital S P I R I T, um, that which is born of spirit, the capital S P I R I T, um, produces lowercase S P I R I T. And so when we have a spiritual birth, then something spiritual happens in you. There's a spiritual man that's created in you, um, that is born in you, that's birthed in you, and something has to happen with him. So Jesus says what you're going to have to do is when that spirit, more, that spirit man is born, that's when you receive the Holy Ghost, there has to be some type of circumcision that takes place or a water baptism. How do I know that the, uh, the water baptism is a spiritual circumcision? Well, Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. This is exactly why Jesus is saying you have to be born of water and the Spirit. It says this, Colossians chapter 2, 11 and 12. says, in whom also ye are circumcised, watch this though, with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And so then at the end of the day, there's a spiritual circumcision that takes place to the spirit man. It's not just us saying, well, I just got baptized so people can know it. But if you really want to be part of what God is doing, the agreement, there has to be some circumcision that takes place. It was an everlasting covenant. It was a covenant not only to those natural individuals, but also to the spiritual, which is us. And so God has prepared a way for us to receive a spiritual circumcision. The spiritual circumcision is water baptism as it states here in Colossians chapter 2. So everybody that wants to go to heaven... They have to be baptized. There's no question about it. You say, well, I'm going to get the inheritance anyway. Well, God said if they don't, if they don't fall in line with this circumcision stuff, <clears throat> then, then they can forget the, the promises. So you're not going to just take the promises from God. I have to be spiritually circumcised. I have to be baptized. There is no question about it. Um, if it's, it's an everlasting covenant. 
is something that's not going to go away at any time soon. Once we get into heaven, that'll be done with. But at this point in time, if you want to go to heaven, you have to be um, spiritually circumcised. Um, and so Jesus says it like this, except the man be born of water and in the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. It sometimes blows my mind. People think they're going to get in any way they can. Well, I'm a good person. Um, I, I give to the poor. Um, I do all this good stuff. Well, Jesus didn't mention any of that stuff. He says, except you fall in line with the covenant. This is what Jesus is really talking about. But he's speaking about it in a spiritual sense. Because Nicodemus kind of felt like, well, maybe he's talking about maybe me going back into my mother's womb and being born again. He said, no, 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 no. I'm trying to show you something spiritual that's going on right now. He said, and except this spiritual thing happens, you can kiss heaven goodbye. So don't think that you're going to go to heaven if you have not been baptized. This is what Jesus is telling him. If you haven't been baptized, then you're not in agreement. You're not part of the covenant and you're cut off. I don't want to be cut off. I want to receive the blessings and the inheritance. You don't even need to sing about the blessings of Abraham if you have not been baptized. And so you need to be baptized. There's no question. So don't let anyone ever tell you, well, you don't really, it doesn't take all of that. Look, I'm reading the, listen, sometimes you need to read contracts. Sometimes, I'm trying not to preach. You need to read the contracts sometimes. And you say, well, did you read your contract? Did you see that in there? And it's not really something that's hidden. It, Jesus said, except the man be born of water and spirit, he cannot. So it's not something that's small or hidden. It's something we need to do, simply put. So don't let anyone um, uh, persuade you any other way. Furthermore, what does it do? And, and again, this really is not an exhaustive study. Um, I, I, I took more time editing than anything else. Uh, but what does it do? What, I understand, okay, um, it, it puts me into uh, agreement with God and um, it, it, it ensures those things. Um, but it also, it does something to our spirits when we're um, baptized. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and this is a very familiar passage of Scripture, but if you will pull it up, um, if you want to go to it in your script, in your text, or in your Bible, um, that would be good as well. Um, sometimes we know stuff by heart, but sometimes we can misquote stuff and we think we, we know it. So during Bible study, it's a good time to look at it again and read it. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so, for the remission of sins is what we're going to really uh, emphasize here, because Peter said, uh, And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and it has a purpose. And that's what we're going to talk about, this purpose. It's for the remission of sins. Remission means to cancel a debt. Um, there's some issues going on. I got some debt, and um, it'd be nice if they were canceled out. So, so Peter said, here's what you need to do spiritually um, to cancel your debt. What you need to do is you need to be baptized um, in the name of Jesus Christ, and that will remit or remove um, to cancel out that debt that you have because sin um, causes us to have to pay a debt at some point in time. In the book of Romans, it says that for the wages of sin is death, and so the payment uh, for sin is death. And so everyone uh, that, that's in sin and they're wanting to pay their own price for it, well, then it's going to cost you your life. But if you don't want to pay for it, then what you're going to have to do is be baptized because it will remit your sins. So how does that happen, though, um, practically? Somebody uh, sung, nothing can wash away my sins. Uh, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So um, you say, well, listen, it's the blood of Jesus that really washes away my sin. I couldn't agree with you more. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. Let's consider that. I told you we're going to be going to a lot of scriptures. Um, Hebrews chapter 9. Thank God for these monitors. Technology is good, even though I got my paper here just in case. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, and, and almost all things are by the law, purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And so there is no remission without blood being shed. This makes sense. I just mentioned the wages of sin is death. And so um, there has to be some type of bloodshed um, that, that happens so that your sins can be, our sin can be remitted. Um, it's a law. He says, by law, um, everything is uh, purged by, almost all things are purged. By blood. Um, I didn't bring up all the scriptures, but there's a, a place in Revelation that 
talks about um, the books being open, and we're going to be judged out the book. And so that judge, which is God, looking through that book, he's going to judge every man according to his deeds. I put it like this. I train people to stand trial uh, for, uh, for a living. And um, I talk to them about getting their record expunged. As much as they may be released from jail or, um, or something like that, well, they've been allowed out. So they, they have a second chance in the community, in society. So it's a type of forgiveness, which is repentance. Uh, God will forgive us. So we need God to forgive us. However, a lot of individuals with various records um, have a hard time getting a job because of their record. And we also have a record. You don't know God is keeping record of our deeds. The Bible says it's going to open up the book, and, and based on what our deeds were, we're going to be judged by those deeds. Well, I would like for God to look at my record and find that it's a clear record at the end of the day. He says the way that's going to happen by the law, spiritual law, um, or by the law of God, it's going to take blood to do that. In the Old Testament, and we're not going to go into it um, too, at all, really, too much, um, but there are blood substitutions. Um, so that individual, that individual that sinned uh, in the Old Testament, they had a way of having their sins forgiven or remitted because something else died. They didn't have to die for it. Um, so they, what God would do is he put something in place where they would kill some goats or lambs or bulls, um, turtle doves, um, birds, things like that. Animals suffered because of us. And so um, God gave them substitutions. And one prominent uh, animal was the lamb that had to go and die. And the blood would actually be what, what remitted their sins. But if they didn't follow this, um, th this thing where they had to sacrifice these animals, well, then the blood really are, would be on their hands or their sins would be on their hands. So God made a way because of the blood of these animals. In John chapter 1, verse 29, um, it tells us by the lamb, um, that really is, is the lamb that we all need. In John chapter 1, verse 29, Scripture says, The next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so what he's saying here, now this is the man, this is the lamb um, that God has sent that, that's going to die. And of course it's going to be because of his blood. It's going to take away or remit or cancel the debt of the sin of the world. And so Jesus then, uh, the blood of Jesus is, is, was really for our sins, to wash away our sins. But here's the thing about that. The blood always had to be applied. It wasn't so much that blood was shed and that was it. There needed to be an application of the blood. You'll go to some churches, they'll tell you that, well, the blood, Jesus died for your sins. That's all it takes. I would disagree. I was, thank God no one has stones. Because people, what? It's the blood of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus, but not the blood of Jesus all by itself. This, the, the simple fact that he died, it may not apply to you unless you apply the blood to you. So a dead lamb alone is insufficient, is what I'm trying to explain. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. And this is really the institution, in a sense, um, of this blood sacrifice of this lamb. And to give you a little background while you're turning to it, um, Israel was in bondage to Egypt at this particular time. And they wanted to be free. And at the end of uh, various plagues on um, Egypt, the Lord had delivered them out. But he says what he was going to do for that last plague was kill all of the firstborn of the male children um, in Egypt. He said, now, the way that you're going to um, uh, you're going to be spared from this death angel is not just because you're Israeli. People say, well, I'm Israeli. He knows the difference. Because in reality, all the other nine plagues, because they were in the land of Goshen, is almost like it was a cutoff. And they didn't, they didn't suffer all the other stuff. But he said, for this particular thing, the only way you're going to survive this is, is I'm going to give you um, uh, kind of a, uh, give you some instructions that's going to allow you to be spared. And what he told them to do is go get a lamb. And uh, without going through all the details, but it had to be a, a, a lamb without spot and blemish and so forth. And he said, what you need to do is you need to go kill that lamb, slay the lamb. But he says, after you've slain the lamb, what you need to do is you need to take the blood and you need to put it on the doorpost and on the lintel. You need to apply it to your house. And the scripture says in verse 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token. Remember that word token? It shall be a sign or a token upon the houses where ye are. 
And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So when I come, I need to see that sign. Remember, it's the same wording or verbiage that's used uh, when we're talking about um, the, the baptism. Uh, we're talking about the circumcision. There was a sign. There needed to be something there. That's interesting to note. But anyway, so he says, what you need to do is you need to apply it. So if that Israeli would have said, well, you know what, let me just get a lamb, kill it, and send it to my backyard. I've killed the lamb and gone back into my house. Then that child would have died. Was the lamb slain? Yes. But was it applied? No. And that would have been the issue. So the lamb had to be slain and it had to be applied to that house. And, and the scripture says, and when, and when the Lord passed over, he would see the blood on the house and say, well, I'm going to pass over this house. That tells me then that not only that Jesus, not only did Jesus have to die, but somehow or another, I need to apply his blood to my life. I, I, I thank God for his death. I thank God that it's been slain, but there's some way or another, I need to apply the blood to my life. And so how can we practically apply the blood um, to our life? Well, the blood is really applied through the water. Remember early I made mention of how that uh, in the Old Testament, they had these substitutions um, for, for uh, the, the individuals said they didn't have to shed blood. The animals would die in its stead. One of the um, uh, substitutions was this a bird. And it's in Leviticus chapter 14. And the Le Leviticus chapter 14 goes into detail uh, what is called the law of the leper. When you look at that scripture, the leprosy uh, is a type of sin. It's a type of sin. It's a, it's, it was a disease in the flesh that ate up the flesh. And so um, an, an individual will have to go to the priest and, and have to do some things and be declared clean. Leviticus chapter 14, and we're going to look at just verse 6 and 7 to give us an, an idea of what I'm talking about in applying the blood. At the end of, uh, you know, the, the priest had to do a number of things to make sure that somebody was clean. It talks about it earlier on in other chapters. Um, but, but at the end of it all, to declare him clean, some things had to happen at the end. It says in, in verse 6, as for the living bird, because what will happen is they would kill a bird. They would have two birds, kill one bird, and then there will also be a living bird at the end of it all. Um, but in the, in the bird that was killed, the blood was mixed with water. It says this in, in verse 6, as for the living bird, he shall take it. And the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them in the uh, and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. So to apply the blood onto that leprous individual, we would use this living bird, but he will also um, use the blood and the water of the one that was killed and sprinkle it onto this individual that was leprous. And then he would pronounce him clean. It wasn't until this particular thing happened that he was pronounced clean. He could have looked in his garment and done all of those things that it talks about in previous verses and chapters um, to, to look at him to declare him clean. But at some point in time, the leprous individual had to have the blood sprinkled over him, and that was done with running water. And so there's a living water um, that, was, that was applied to this individual. So water baptism, really we apply the blood of Jesus in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, which we read. It says it, we need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Because it's the blood of Jesus that, 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 that washes away our sins, but spiritually it happens through the waters of baptism. It's almost like spiritually that blood is in that water. And thank God we don't see it like we don't physically see it because we'll be... It's hard enough to get some people to go in there, especially when it's cold. So thank God it's not red. But, um, but, but spiritually, there's something that happens that, that, that applies the blood of Jesus onto our lives. And when we come out of there, the priest, the high priest, not the preacher, but the high priest pronounces you clean because you're washed in that water. So it washes away and makes us a candidate for heaven. It washes away our sins and pronounces us clean. We're no longer leprous anymore. So you want your sins to be washed away. Uh, you don't want to just be a good person and still full of leprosy. 
Well, what we want is our sins and that thing to be washed away and we're pronounced clean before God. That has to happen in the waters of baptism. And my last point is this. The mode in which it should be administered. Again, we go back to the scripture that we read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Acts 2 and 38 says this. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to read to you a definition that I uh, copied out of um, the Strong's Concordance um, regarding this word, baptize. Um, it's, it's from the Greek word, baptizo. And it means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, uh, to submerge a vessel sunk to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, to wash oneself, bathe, to overwhelm, not to be confused with bapto. Bapto is another word um, that, 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 that refers to in the Greek, um, putting something, dipping something under water. And he gives an example. He says, the clearest example that shows the meaning of baptizo is a text from the Greek poet and physician, the Candor, who lived about 200 B.C., it is a recipe for making pickles and is helpful because it uses both words. Nicander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetables should first be dipped, bapto, into boiling water and then baptized, baptizo, in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersing of vegetables in a solution, but the first is temporary. The second, the act of baptizing, baptizo, the vegetable, produces a permanent change. And so when you put that pickle or cucumber under the boiling water, it may soften it up. But what you taste at the end of the day, because it's been immersed and left and caused to change permanently, uh, the taste and, and everything about that pickle uh, was the vinegar. And so he uses the words differently. He said, well, you can bapto it to soften it up. But if you want the permanent change and you want the taste of it to change, what you need to do is baptizo, is you need to let it sit in there. So the, so the mode of baptism is to submerge, to completely put under, and, and there's an indication because of the Greek word here that when that happens, there's a permanent change. It's not that you just been, something happened and you just got wet that day. That's bapto, but he doesn't use the word bapto. And when you read um, in the places where it uses baptizo, it, it's talking about a permanent change happen. And this is the word that's used here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter says, what needs to happen? You need to go under the water and allow it to cause a permanent change. Furthermore, what's declared, uh, the declarate, declarate, declaration made over that candidate. In Acts chapter 19, and I'm going to go quickly because of the time. If you could pull it up on the scripture, Acts chapter 19, verse 3 and 5. And please, um, if you have the ability, write down the scriptures. You can definitely read those a little bit later. And Acts chapter 19, verse 3 and 5 says, And he said unto them, speaking of um, Paul, speaking of 12 disciples in Ephesus, Unto what then were you baptized? And, he, and they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so here you find some individuals that were already baptized. And the interesting thing about them, they were believers and disciples. These are unbelievers. And they were believers in Jesus. So how do you know that, Brother Lynn? Well, the Bible says that they were um, disciples of John the Baptist. John the Baptist's main purpose was the forerunner of Jesus. As a matter of fact, when Jesus came, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world. He, this is the one that's supposed to come after me. I, indicating this is the one I've been talking about all this time. And so if they were disciples of John the Baptist, or they were already believers in who Jesus or the Christ would be. Um, they probably would, they may have been there when John baptized Jesus and made that de declaration because these, again, were uh, followers of John the Baptist. And so they may have been contemporaries with Jesus and John the Baptist at that time. However, they had only been baptized um, by way of this baptism of repentance um, for the remission of sins that John the Baptist was baptizing in at that particular time, which was from heaven. Jesus argued with some individuals, or some people arguing with Jesus, and he said, well, the baptism that John did, is that from heaven or is of man? Indicating that, look, it was really from heaven, but the people that he was talking to didn't want to say it. But so it was something that was commanded by God. However, for this time frame, under this covenant and agreement, there was a specific way to do it. So it was a good thing, great, you got baptized, 
but did you do it the way that it needs to be done now is what Paul uh, was, was emphasizing here. And it really had to do with, they, he found out they didn't get the Holy Ghost or they didn't know about the Holy Ghost. He said, well, you know, well, how were you baptized? Because both of them really should be preached together. Um, and so then th there's a specific way to be baptized. They were baptized one way and then they got rebaptized in the name of Jesus and are in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so if you've been baptized any other way, you need to be rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's not so much that you're just baptized, but there's a mode of baptism that individuals need to take. You have to be submerged and it has to be in the name of Jesus. Other um, examples have, uh, are in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Um, church leaders were also baptized this way. And this is an account of Paul's baptism. Acts 22, verse 16 says, And now why tarriest thou, this is Ananias speaking to Paul, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So he was baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. And then also Acts chapter 10, verse 48, um, Peter deemed it necessary to baptize these individuals um, in the name of Jesus. It says in verse 48, and he commanded them, to be baptized, again, in the name of the Lord, then pray they him to tarry certain days. So it's not optional, and there is a specific way to do it. Um, if we want to be part of what God is doing and we want to make it into heaven, there is no other options. You have to be baptized, and it has to be done in the name of Jesus Christ, and it will remit your sins. Um, it's a spiritual thing that God is doing, and it's a wonderful thing. And the great thing about it, it's easy. It, it's not really that hard. It's just a mindset is that I believe the Word of God, I trust in the Word of God, God said it, and I'm not going to try to make any excuses, I'm simply going to do what God has said. It's much easier um, than the circumcision that those grown men had to do. I'm pretty sure that was difficult, but I believe they had greater faith um, than, than some people do nowadays because they had to have some physical circumcision done at that age that incapacitated them for a long period of time. However, baptism in Jesus' name, you simply need to do it and you just need to dry off in 10 minutes you're done. And so uh, it, it, it doesn't take that much. You just need to believe in the word of God.